Chinatown appears as a mysterious world filled with sights and sounds. Distinctive architectural features. Crowded energetic streets. The aroma of delicious foods. And culturally distinctive wares. To understand today's Chinatown, you must know Chinatown's past. Journey with these unique individuals and experience their special relationship with Chinatown. Welcome to Hawaii's Chinatown. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Confucius, 5th century BC. The ancient philosopher Confucius believed to attain happiness, success and longevity, human order must follow the divine order. By honoring culture, loyalty, correct action and trust, Chinese today follow their past rituals. Well, as you know, Confucian ethics have hierarchy, and if you observe the hierarchy of things, there will be peace and harmony in your family and the universe. And so, Confucianism is built upon subordination of the people to their ruler, of women to men, of younger to the elder. Author Pam Chun chronicled her great-grandfather, Lao Ao Leong, a sojourner seeking wealth in Hawaii the Chinese once called Sandalwood Mountain. Well, he came from a very wealthy family that lost its fortune in China, as happens a lot of times. It was times of famine, times of warlords running throughout uh, China. Sojourners left China soon after the Manchu dynasty was defeated by England. The 1842 Opium War forced an open-door policy, permitting foreign trade and allowing people to leave China for the first time. Chinese came to Hawaii uh, because of the internal struggle in China and uh, because of reform, revolution, and uh, strife between Hakka and Bundi, two groups uh, fighting in South China, in Guangdong province. Most sojourners came from Guangdong or Fujian provinces in South China. After enduring the harsh ocean voyage, they faced extreme hardships upon arrival. Waves of, of Chinese immigrants who, who came to uh, Hawaii in search of a, a better life. Um, uh, many of them came as contract laborers. Um, kind of like indentured servants, and they came to work in the, the sugar and, and pineapple fields. Workers signed five-year contracts, hoping to prosper before returning, only to be trapped in a cycle of slave-like conditions of harsh work and poverty. Holy labor is uh, forced labor. Contract labor is labor who sign a contract. Everything has to go with contract. Basically, the, the contract labor, laborer did not uh, enjoy much better privilege than slave labor or coolie labor. But however, they are free to leave the minute contract is up to. Or food and clothes and the housing supplied by the uh, planter. The individual, $3 a month, six days a week, and uh, no family life or recreation. That the Chinese are in most respects undesirable is a fact, but that they were necessary in the beginning to give impetus to agriculture, to supply labor not obtainable elsewhere, cannot be denied. 
Captain George Vancouver, 1801. Determined sojourners kept coming to Sandalwood Mountain. Such a fate awaited Ella Leong. Men who stand on hill with mouth open will wait long time for roast duck to drop in. Confucius, 5th century BC. As Oahu's population grew, Chinese street peddlers became merchants by opening markets selling groceries and provisions. The Chinese laborers have five years contract with the planters. The minute the contract fulfilled, they would leave the plantation and come to town as peddlers or hawkers. On every Saturday night, my father would take me to Chinatown. You know, Saturday was the night that uh, they all uh, congregated in Chinatown. Uh, the Chinatown I knew were filled with Chinese men who came in from the plantations and from the rice fields and to really have their hair cut, have, go to a movie or to uh, get something to eat. Well, they were in the rice fields, in the taro fields, in the plantations. And this was the night that they all congregated. Came to town to get, uh, to have a drink of uh, uh, sweet tea with, with eggs, or uh, have uh, a gruel chuk, or what the Chinese call chuk. And uh, people, there were no, no health uh, pre precautions. They were, they were cleaning their bowl in a, in a little bucket. <laughs> and they were reusing it. Yeah. And those days were very, very, uh, uh, there were very few laws on health. When my grandmother married my grandfather, she was so happy because she wanted to marry an American because Americans could only have one wife. And she had had a lot of offers before in China, but they were second, third, and fourth husbands, not worth marrying. And here she saw the small storefront stacked floor to ceiling with boxes and bins jammed in, all dusty. And what Lao Alum would do is he would get his bins and boxes and push them all the way up to the sidewalk. So if anyone wanted to walk by, they had to meander their way through all his, all his produce that was out there in the front on the sidewalk. And it was dusty because in those days the streets were dusty. And my grandmother looked at that. She told her husband, take me back to China. Social meeting associations, or tongs, began to form according to members' origin of city, province, or dialect. Well, the first thing that the Chinese thought about was to find a place where they could congregate. The people from Kali, the people from Kaimaki, all got together and from their respective hometowns and districts in, in, uh, in China and created a club for the people who uh, would come to town so that they can meet each other. Each other. Uh, little by little, uh, these societies bought some land to take care of their own people. And that's the reason why you have so many uh, places where the Chinese can congregate. Migrants find it very comfortable because most of them are illiterate. And they want someone to communicate, help them to write letters to send back home so they can communicate with their home villages. Now the amazing thing is that at that time, the Chinese only did business with Chinese. Japanese only did business with Japanese. And all the ethnic groups tended to patronize their own, on their own kind. But Lao Alun wasn't in Chinatown. For whatever reason, 
he ended up in Kaka'ako. And because he, he, his business was with inside of Iolani Palace, he began supplying the royal, the royal family with fruits and vegetables. And because of his proximity right there in the heart of Honolulu, he, became, he began to know all the American businessmen and the power elite. Senator Hiram Fong tells me he remembers going to Lao Long's store as a child. On one hand, Lao Long would be talking on the phone to a wholesale customer. On the other hand, he'd work on an abacus with a customer who'd come into his store. And at the same time, he'd be ordering all his sons about because all his sons worked for him for almost nothing, even up until the time he died. The soldier journals come to Hawaii, mostly single men. And that's the, one of the reasons to be criticized as a too large single pop, man's population. And uh, also that they do not bring their wives to the U.S. because they all dream someday they will get rich and return to China. Some single men found relief from the stress of hard labor and loneliness through vice. Gambling, prostitution, and opium smoking became a diversion for the lonely stranger in a strange land. Well, the opium uh, license was, I think, was $30,000 that the person could use opium. Their life in the plantation was very monotonous. Uh, they tried to numb themselves by open smoking and also get some excitement in gambling. And uh, because it's an overwhelmingly single man society, so prostitution becomes rampant. Uh, there were quite a few shops around that I saw them smoking opium, but later on uh, the laws were uh, enforced that you couldn't speak, you couldn't smoke uh, opium. An American mystery writer named Earl Durr Biggers, while on vacation in Hawaii, read a Honolulu newspaper article about the Chinese detective Chang Apana. Joy in heart more desirable than bullet. Biggest mistakes in history make by people who didn't think. Inspired by the heroics of Detective Chang, Biggers created an enduring new hero, Charlie Chan. Detective Apana is probably one of the most unique officers in our history and one that um, people have, have always been interested in from the, the, the first time we started to, to feature him in the museum. It began when I found a newspaper article. Of, I looked further into uh, um, other newspaper articles and I got into our personal uh, logs, our um, uh, employee logs and the things that we had from the day and found the connection between uh, Chang Apana and Earl Biggers who wrote the first novel where Charlie Chan was introduced to the, in, uh, to the world. And basically piecing together the information and some other articles that I found um, came to the conclusion and later on proven that the character Charlie Chan is based on the life of Detective Chang Apana of the Honolulu Police Department. I had seen movies depicting and read stories about Chinatown and wicked Chinese villains, and it struck me that a Chinese hero, trustworthy, benevolent, and philosophical, could come nearer to presenting a correct portrayal of the race. Earl Biggers, 1919. Well, before he became a police officer, uh, Chang Apana was a Paniolo, a cowboy. And he was very familiar with the whip, very comfortable with the whip, and he chose the whip as his duty weapon. Um, and one of the uh, um, uses for that particular weapon was, uh, during that period of time, uh, sundown, dark, was curfew for juveniles. Um, but they still like to run the streets and have a good time. Well, Chang Apana got into the habit of just walking up and down the street and cracking his whip a few times. Well, he was really the man to be feared. We young kids who always heard about Chang Apana, Apana, yeah, and that uh, he really came, uh, wanted discipline. 
He was well respected by the people because he was straightforward and, and you could depend on, on, on his word. At that time also opium smuggling was a problem. Gambling was a major problem there. So those were some of the things that he excelled in. He was actually the first undercover officer for our police department. And uh, he plied his undercover trade, as it were, in Chinatown where he posed as workers and uh, people of that nature. And during that period, uh, people that, that were workers, the criminals really didn't pay them any, any, any attention. They were really no one to be concerned with. And that was how Chang Apana basically made some of his uh, opium uh, busts uh, from the opium rings and, and uh, very high profile gambling busts. He was the, the epitome of the dedicated police officer. He was a part of the community. He was not separate from the community. I think that was a, a guideline for, for other officers within the department in how they dealt with the people here uh, in the community. And that has been a part of our history. Uh, when new recruits come uh, graduate, one of the things that we do is we bring them th uh, through the museum and we introduce them to Detective Chang Apana. We give them a bit of his history and what law enforcement meant to him and what he brought to the community. And hopefully that'll pass on. So even now, Detective Papana is still doing his job. To be wrong is nothing unless you continue to remember it. Confucius, 5th century BC. By the 1870s, a national depression, along with drought and bank failures, created an anti-Chinese sentiment. Immigrant laborers were willing to take work for lower wages on grueling jobs and not unionize. Basically, Chinese work against themselves because they would take any job. So the, the Caucasian workers believed Chinese would work for lower wages. So this kind of sentiment, anti-Chinese sentiment, moved from U.S. mainland to Hawaii also. Chinese became scapegoats for the economic troubles because of their race and culture. Anti-Chinese agitators pressured Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 forbidding Chinese laborers from entering the United States for 10 years. In the 1800s, it was not a good time to be Chinese in Hawaii. There were racial exclusion laws. Um, the Hawaiian Chinese exclusion law was in effect. There was racial discrimination. The, the Hawaiian monarchy uh, was in power, but it was being threatened by the American businessmen, and the Chinese were caught in the middle of this. Anti-Chinese sentiment was increasing on the mainland. The political and financial powers in Hawaii echoed that same attitude. In 1877, the Hawaii government and uh, the planters start import all the ethnic groups into Hawaii and uh, do not consider Chinese the, so the only source for labor. So therefore, in 1877, they started restricting Chinese immigrants into Hawaii. That's the arrivals cannot exceed the departures. The Chinese were blamed for rising unemployment among the ranks of frustrated masses, who themselves were immigrants just a generation before. 
Wealthy plantation owners, aware that anti-slavery sentiment was growing in the U.S., promoted its coolie trade as an exception since Congress had no official jurisdiction over Hawaii. Also, there were laws against the Chinese doing business, and there were laws specifically aimed at the Chinese from owning tools like saws and chisels, so they would stay on the plantation and not even come into town and be a competition for anyone else. So it was really a tough time to be Chinese here in Hawaii. These beasts in human form brought their unmentionable diseases, opium pipes, and the accursed leprosy. Editor, Hawaiian Monthly, 1884. By the 1880s, conditions in the Chinese quarter were overcrowded, and an outbreak of smallpox spread disease and fear. Quarantine stations were constructed on Sand Island to isolate the sick. Racist tensions were smoldering just beneath the surface of civility. One spark could ignite disorder. Oh yes, this was a major fire for Honolulu. Uh, at that time, it is known as the Great Fire of Honolulu. Uh, nobody knows the cause of the first fire of 1886, uh, but it started at Wu building. Uh, today, Wu building still stands there. That there were about 20 Chinese um, gamblers up on the second floor and they were either gambling or they had some kind of lottery and there was some kind of dispute and one of them threw their cards or some kind of paper into the fire and another gambler took it out and as he took it out um, they started a brawl and as they're fighting well that part that pieces of paper that they pulled out started the fire in the room but uh, however um it started from there, it was an accident. Nobody knew why, and they just knew how. It did not spread too far. And the next thing that was witnessed was people running out from the second floor, and below the second floor was a restaurant, so there was quite a, quite a bit of people in that building. Bad times for Chinatown struck again. This time, panic prevailed over reason when word that bubonic plague had taken many lives in Chinatown. Little was known about the causes of bubonic plague, nor its cure. Although attempts at eradication were heavy-handed by today's standards, the Board of Health ordered the burning of buildings where plague victims were found. The situation today is not reassuring. With the breaking out of another case of the plague in the block of King, Richards, Merchant, and Alakea Streets. People living in the city have become greatly alarmed. Evening Bulletin, January 12, 1900. The first bubonic plague that they had was somewhere in the beginning of December. Maybe about December 12 was their first bubonic plague uh, incident. And from there they were very proactive and of the health department started burning these, these homes, these blocks. In 1900, uh, HFD set Chinatown on fire in order to get rid of the disease of bubonic plague. What they started doing was they marked off the city in blocks and they numbered them. And every day, the fire department would position themselves around one of these blocks and control burning, light it up, and, and burn it. So they said on January 20th, 1900, and the fire spread quickly and burned all the 38 acres. The evening bulletin account read, the wind suddenly increased in strength and sparks were carried to the tower of Kamakapili Church. Then came great trouble. 
Kamakapili Church caught fire from a steeple. Again, the wind died down and the tower burned along slowly for a little while. Again, the wind freshened considerably and sparks from the buildings along Baratania Street were carried to the Joss House near Kamakapili. The inn could readily be seen and everyone moved out as speedily as possible, taking along only books and papers necessary to work the place. The fire is not yet under control. It has reached the independent office on King Street and is moving toward the sea. The residents of Chinatown are quartered in Kauai Hau Churchyard. Evening Bulletin, January 20, 1900. Besides burning the blocks on a daily basis, after this 1900 Chinatown fire, a few days later, they continued burning again. Orders received by the Board of Fire Commissioners and the Chief Engineer relating to sanitary fires, or more correctly speaking, such fires have been ordered by the Board of Health. George Manson, Honolulu Fire Department, April 16, 1900. At that time, the fire department was very limited as far as equipment that they had, um, water supplies were limited. The material that was burning, which was wood, and how it was so compact, one of the problems was they were all built so tightly close together that once one burned, the, the next one next to it would burn too. The plague lasted for three months. So in one way it did stop the plague, and I can't say that the fire itself stopped the plague but the plague was here in Oahu, or in Chinatown, for three months. Dozens of bubonic plague victims were hastily buried in mass graves across from nearby Kauai Hau Church. Ironically, a decade later, the Honolulu Fire Department built a fire station over the unmarked graves, and for many years, the building was said to be haunted by restless souls. Our greatest glory is not in ever falling, but in rising every time we fall. Confucius, 5th century BC. With the Chinatown fire of 1900, it was leveled, everything burnt, because the majority of the buildings were made out of wood at that time. And so soon after that, everything was leveled out, and with the new building codes, many of these buildings were now constructed of brick or some kind of masonry. The homes were now completely built differently. Uh, a lot of safe precautions were used, more brick were used. So in a whole sense, you got a a large area of development at one time. When the 1900 Great Fire destroyed all of Chinatown, here was a Chinese merchant who was not doing business in Chinatown, but was doing business in Kaka'ako, right next to the area where they brought all the people who had been quarantined. So here all the refugees from Chinatown were brought right next to his store, and there, of course, he made his reputation. Then he must have really felt um, that Chinatown had promise because I've been told that he owned half the land in Chinatown, all the way from his store up to Nu'uana River and from his store all the way down to Honolulu Harbor. But then there's this Chinese ethic of always going back and proving yourself. So I think that's the reason why he went back to China so much because he wanted to prove to them that yes, he was a poor boy. He came back a rich person, and it's a matter of honor, very Chinese, very honor and face was very important to him. 
Well, there's a 1790 law, U.S. law, that says the only naturalized citizens of the United States can be white. But because they are Chinese, and because there is this Chinese Exclusion Act, which under the 1900 Organic Act extends to Hawaii from the mainland, they are considered second-class citizens. They are considered U.S. citizens, non-resident. And because of that, every time Lao Lerong goes back to China, he has to go through some very demeaning interviews. Out of the ashes rose a new Chinatown united by tragedy and strengthened by hope of a prosperous future. A lesson taken from understanding their past and adapting to new realities. Chinese were allowed to marry Hawaiians. So most people marry for citizenship. But Hawaii was a kingdom. Chinese were actually after land. Only Hawaiians can buy land. And Chinese couldn't, uh, I mean, non-citizens cannot buy land. But Hawaii Chinese are lucky they could marry uh, local people. And uh, it, sometimes they have two families, one family in China, another family in Hawaii. It was acceptable for both Chinese and Hawaiian custom because Hawaiian never considered marriage as forever until death do they part. It's just for that time. So for both countries customs, it's all right to have more than one wife. Uh, when the Americans took over, here was this Chinese man, a non-resident U.S. citizen, naturalized, uh, when, when you only had to be, you had to be white to be naturalized. And not only that, he had five wives. And of course, the Americans, you only could have one wife. Around 1905, 1906, they arrested him for bigamy. And he was very defiant. He went in and said, of course I have five wives, you know? And he says, and he, the records say that he told them, you knew I had five wives when you took over America. What am I supposed to do? And so he pays her fine and goes back to work. Well, a few la years later, he must have really upset someone because they arrested him again for the same charge. And he ignores the arrest warrant. So finally, on a Saturday, and I can't understand why the courts were open on Saturday, they send a sheriff to Lao Lung's store on a Saturday, arrest him. Saturday must have been his busi busiest day. He must have been really upset. And so he storms back in the court. Sanford Dole is the judge at the time. Lao Long pleads no contest, pays their $500 fine, sits in the uh, judge's office for an hour, which is his uh, punishment, and storms back to work. So he was very defiant of the Americans, even though they were in power. And I think he knew a lot of the people, and he was just really upset at them. Another influential man who got his start in Honolulu made his name not in business, but in politics. An individual should not have too much freedom. A nation should have absolute freedom. Dr. Sun Yun-shan, 1903. He is the founder of the Republic of China, but people refer to him more as the, the father of, of modern China rather than the founder of uh, the Republic of China. Because they see that if, if there was no Sun Yat-sen and his revolution, uh, there would not be the modern China as it, as it is becoming today. When he first came over, he couldn't speak a word of English and uh, studied at, at Iolani for two years, which uh, was a British bishop's school. So in, in Iolani, it's believed that's the time when he was converted to Christianity. And uh, I, I think that those uh, Christian beliefs and values were to uh, later shape his, his revolutionary career. Dr. Sun Yat-sen came to Hawaii in 1879, and he attended Yolani School and Punahou School. Oahu College, being run by American missionaries, would teach more, more subject matter on the American Revolution. And I, I think that uh, Dr. Sun was, was very inspired by um, the, the American Revolution. 
if we know his famous writing is Sanming Zhu Yi or Three People's Principle, we would find that it's very familiar to most Americans because Lincoln believed that uh, government should be of the people, by the people, and for the people. I, I think that uh, the, the, the local Hawaii Chinese community is, is very proud of the fact that Dr. Sun grew up here in Hawaii. Th this was the first place where he encountered um, Western ideals, encountered Christianity, uh, which was to shape his, his revolutionary career. Um, in the matter of fact, Hawaii is the birthplace of the Chinese Revolution because in 1894, Dr. Sun founded the, the Shinsong Hui or the Revived China Society as his first revolutionary organization. And with, with the support that Dr. Sun received from the local Hawaii Chinese community, he was able to network with Chinese, overseas Chinese communities around the world to support the revolution. Dr. Sun published his revolutionary ideas seeking the final overthrow of the Manchu dynasty and the creation of a democratic China. We must appeal to the people of the United States in particular for your sympathy and support, either moral or material, because you are a Christian nation, because we intend to model our government after yours, above all because we are the champion of liberty and democracy. Dr. Sun Yong-sen, 1904. So, so in many ways, I, I see Dr. Sun's writings as, as prophecies. So much of the way he envisioned the world at his time has become reality today. Yet during his time, uh, people castigated him and jeered him, um, thought of him as an idealistic dreamer, uh, he, he, thinking his, his ideals were, were not pragmatic, they were impractical and, and too, too idealistic. But, but today, they, they, they've, they've become a reality. And, and if you see the way China is progressing and developing, it, it, it is still the revolution in progress. The, the modern Chinese revolution started by, by Sun Yat-sen, it's, it's still ongoing. Dr. Sun Yat-sen was much respect in both in Taiwan and mainland China because it's a three people's principle and five power government. Uh, you wonder why five? Uh, three powers, executive, executive legislative, and uh, judicial branch. He had census and uh, examination, which was traditional Chinese government's branch. So he always tried to combine Western thought with Chinese tradition. More than anything else, he, he had a really beautiful vision of how to teach the Chinese people to build a modern nation. And, and that's really what he's, he's respected for today, is he is really the, um, the, the visionary and the architect of, of modern China. Not, not many people know that uh, Dr. Sun was the first international statesman to advocate international economic cooperation as the key to world peace. The whole world is one family. Dr. Sun Yun-sen, 1910. The strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. Confucius, 5th century BC.
In the 20th century, second generation Chinese began to move out of Chinatown, assimilating into Hawaiian society. Chinese did help build up the multi-ethnic society because uh, Chinatown is never exclusively for Chinese. There's uh, for Hawaiians are in the early period, and later on for now it's for Filipinos and Vietnamese Chinese. So they built, they, the Chinese laborers become peddlers. The peddlers have an integration with the uh, Hawleys and uh, Hawaiians and uh, other ethnic group. So, and also among Chinese themselves. I was very struck by the fact that a lot of men would come to me, these older Chinese men. And here I, here I was you know, of a generation which I had never heard the name Lao Long. And these men would come to me and say, you know, when I first came from China, I want to be just like Lao Alung. And I worked really hard, and I'd go to the store, and I'd watch him and see how he did things, and he was my role model. And so many people have come to me and told me that. And I thought, you know, he impacted so many lives, and he did so much for Hawaii. When he came here, it was a Hawaiian monarchy, and then there was a provisional government, and then there was the Republic of Hawaii, and then the Americans came in. And throughout this time, he had his business, he had his five wives, he had his ten sons, and he just kept on going and making money. So I think he felt that as long as he had his money, his power and influence, and he knew the right people, he could do anything he wanted to do. For some, businesses flourished and fortunes were made. While others did not attain vast wealth, life had greatly improved. The dreams of Sandalwood Mountain had finally come true. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor created a patriotic groundswell within the Chinese-American community, eager to show loyalty toward America. Just a decade before, Hong Kong had been brutalized, where many relatives were murdered or enslaved. Chinese America's sentiment for homeland country was sharpened by the World War II. An American joined the war effort further ignite the explosion of patriotic feeling. Many Chinese want to join the U.S. services, military services. The shameful Chinese Exclusion Act was finally repealed in 1943, and by 1952, naturalization rights extended to persons of all races. With increased shipping and later airplanes, Hawaii became a popular tourist destination and a strategic military position. It happened quite after the Second World War. Uh, so the Second World War, I don't think, did much 
to invigorate Chinatown. The war in Vietnam, uh, I think, uh, when we lost the war and we were obligated to so many people. During the Vietnam War era, the lower portion of Hotel Street within Chinatown fell into disrepair. Rife with crime, drugs, and prostitution, change was desperately needed. Well, the war brought in quite a new, new generation of people. The Vietnamese, the Laotians, uh, and the other people came in after the war. Uh, they reinvigorated Chinatown. In 1973, Chinatown was designated a National Historical Site. That gives Chinese more the Chinatown more prestigious and, the, and the, some money to preserve the old building. Many dilapidated structures qualified for government funding to renovate and preserve the essence of historic Chinatown buildings. For the first time, Chinatown saw a decline in population and business growth. Most sojourners never return to China with fortune and fame. Instead, they firmly established roots in Honolulu, wishing only to be buried in a traditional Chinese cemetery worthy of their ancestors. Lin Yi Chung, uh, which is the Manoa Chinese Cemetery, the, the Chinese association that that runs the uh, Manoa Chinese Cemetery was, was founded and uh, in, in 1849, so over, over 150 years ago. And it was the, the first Chinese association here in Hawaii. And the particular purpose of it was basically benevolent and, and charity in nature to, to take care of, of those sojourners or those immigrants who, who came to Hawaii and if they passed away here, they would, they would have a place to be buried, and buried with excellent feng shui. Find a cemetery, a place where they can bury the dead. And until the time that they, they could zoom the bones and send them back to China. You see, they, want, they wanted to be reburied back in their homeland. But, you know, after one or six, two generations, that, that didn't happen. Chinese people believe that uh, the, the burial of, of the dead is, is very, very important to uh, the descendants of the family, feng shui. The, the feng shui where the ancestors buried has an influence on the descendants. And if the feng shui is good, it will ensure the, the family or the descendants prosperity, and uh, that, the, that the family will continue. The family will have sons and have heirs to, to continue the family name. And so basically the, the ancestor or ancestors will, will not be forgotten. So they, they, they found this place and said, oh, this is, this is a really incredibly special place that uh, must be um, preserved by the Chinese people and, and made into a sacred place for uh, their burial. Then, then over here we have um, uh, Wang Ka Ha Tong, which is the, the Wang Society tomb. And this, this represents like a, the, the big Wang clan um, here, here in Hawaii. And this is, this is also one of the, the best or biggest graves. Um, it's kind of like who's who up here. And then over to the left here, you, you have the uh, mayor of Chinatown, who is Henry uh, Awa. And it says that he was the mayor of Chinatown um, from 1922 to 1973. So for like, like 50 years. 
when you are sitting here or standing under the banyan tree in the back that things are in the balance. You, you can feel it. It's, you, you, you just have this, this special feeling of everything feels good. Everything is in harmony. When Lao Alone died in 1934, the headlines of the Hong Star Bulletin said, Merchant Prince of Hawaii dies, and they equated his life to Horatio Elger. Here's this very poor person who comes to the United States, who was Hawaii at the time, and builds a fortune and a great family and a great legacy. And so he walked up and down the streets of Chinatown, looking for a name, a plaque, name of a store, anything. And we couldn't see anything. So we ended up back where we started, the corner of King and Kekaulihi Street, right in front of Oahu Fish Market. The sun came up, and as we looked up, we saw in the corner of the building, a two-story brick building, identical to all the others there on the block. L. L. Long Block, 1909. His name had been over the heart of Chinatown all this time, and we had never, ever known. And every week, I would go to Chinatown with my grandmother, Lao Feng Yin, to carry all her bags of groceries. And never once did she tell me that my great-grandfather's name was over the heart of Chinatown. Today, Chinatown welcomes new immigrants from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and the Philippines, who rekindle the sojourner's dream of seeking success, happiness, and longevity. Anyone wanting to venture a new start and willing to work hard are greeted by the sight of the Feng Shui gates upon entering Chinatown. Feng translates into air as Shui is to water, which freely flows through the gates encouraging all to enter. Many traditions continue, such as the annual Chinese New Year celebration and Miss Chinatown pageant. An enduring custom that symbolizes family unity, honoring past and present generations. The first day of the New Year celebrations begins with the new moon and ends on the full moon 15 days later. Each new year represents an animal in the Chinese zodiac calendar that has a particular personality. As winter fades and spring approaches, all are seeking to balance the flow of yin and yang by paying homage to the lion. An ancient fable is retold by the lion's dance with fireworks. The lion repels the evil Nian, or mythical dragon-like monster, representing yang. The lions are fed money as a symbol for protection, ensuring future prosperity. Chinatown in Honolulu is unique. It's quite different from other Chinatown. In Hawaii, Chinese are free to reside anywhere they want to. So therefore, Chinatown, to a certain extent, still maintain the Chinese custom. Even though the, the, the Chinese community is so small, um, I mean, it's, it's, its role in, in world history is, is huge. And, and so I, I think that, uh, I, I hope to see a, a museum in, in, in Chinatown, uh, but also um, a commemoration of Hawaii being the birthplace of the modern Chinese revolution. Because one thing I have found out, that the Chinese even though we spread throughout the world, each group has retained different parts of our culture. And so they are seeing what we have retained here in Hawaii. Learning the lessons from the Chinese of honoring culture, loyalty, 
correct action, and trust will ensure future generations that their dreams can come true in Hawaii's Chinatown. like to find out more information about Hawaii's Chinatown, log on to the following websites. Xie Xie Zaijian.